chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. This is a continuation of uh, two weeks ago when I preached on the two natures. We'll uh, rehearse a little bit or review just a touch, not much, but Grace chapter 5, verse 17. Grace, or Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. You find that would stand for the reading of God's word, just one verse. Grace chapter 5, verse 17. It says, For the flesh lust is against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Again, it says, For the flesh lust is against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that that ye would. Father, we're grateful, Lord, we pray that you bless us, and Lord, help us to, to get a hold of exactly uh, what it is, Lord, when you talk about the two natures, and uh, how, Lord, when we got saved, Lord, that uh, we uh, received a spiritual nature, uh, we were given life, we were quickened, and, uh, but, Lord, that didn't kill off uh, the fallen nature that we have, and uh, so, Lord, now we have both a spiritual nature and a fleshly nature. And I pray, Lord, that you speak to our hearts, help us to realize this truth, and, and uh, help us to realize how important it is for a successful walk with you, uh, Lord, that, you, that we realize uh, this, this phenomenon that's going on in our bodies. And so, Lord, just bless us tonight. It's a good time to work. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, as I said, two weeks ago, uh, we looked into the life of Peter. And you know, I've heard more preachers uh, claim their character is more like a Peter than anyone else in the Bible. I've heard tons of preachers say, if I was to compare myself to anybody, Peter, uh, Peter would be the one I would compare myself to. And I've even said that myself. And uh, that's probably 10 to 1. Uh, that, that probably 10 preachers to 1 says that they're more likened to Peter than anybody else in the Bible. you got to ask yourself, well, why is that? Because Peter is the, it's a sad but true account. Uh, when we look at Peter, as far as early in his apostleship, it was, it was a sad but true account of the battle uh, between the, the uh, two natures. Now let's spend a little bit of time just rehearsing what we talked about two weeks ago. And uh, we saw that in the story of Peter, um, that it, there was a confirmation of the two natures that came at salvation. Turn with me to Matthew uh, chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. In your Bible, keep it where you're at. Well, you don't have to keep where you're at. Turn to Matthew chapter 26 tonight. Look what I, uh, and you'll remember some of this. You'll, this. Some of this is familiar to you uh, from a couple of weeks ago. But Matthew chapter 26. Um, and here's the confirmation. Um, even in the times of the apostles when they were following Christ. When Christ was yet here on earth, before he went to the cross, a lot of people questioned, and we talked about this two weeks ago, um, that, that did they have the, 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 uh, the spiritual nature like we have? Uh, because after all, um, uh, they, were, they were with Christ, and Christ had went to the cross, but we do know that what happened is he breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And uh, look at verse uh, 41. In Matthew chapter 26, it says, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. It says, The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now he's talking about that battle that goes on. Now I know, uh, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, that that spirit there might not, that, that definitely might not be talking at that time about the spirit that dwells in us. That's a, a not capitalized spirit. But I know there's times in the Bible that it talks about the Spirit, um, that it's not always capitalized, but uh, we looked at, and we, I think we got some confirmation that these men were saved. Um, I won't take you there, but John chapter 17, when we read that, and it was the prayer that Christ had made uh, to, to God, and uh, when he prayed to his Father, that uh, he, he uh, uh, didn't lose any that the Father had given him. And he was talking, of course, about the apostles and how uh, they were brought out of the world. 
And uh, they were not of the world and all that kind of thing. So I think that's kind of confirmation uh, of salvation. And how when, when you get saved, and we've talked about this, that it's probably one of the greatest feelings that you ever have. When you understand what took place and you get saved, I've seen it myself where people get saved. And we just had a girl down in Lansing uh, a month or so ago uh, when we were down there uh, street preaching for the MSU game. And uh, this young lady came up, she's probably about 19, 20 years old, came up to us and asked us exactly what this was all about as far as uh, what we were doing in the track that we were passing out. And uh, by the time the conversation was over, she accepted uh, Christ as her Savior. And, uh, and one of the first things that she said is that she really felt, um, really felt good about what she had done and uh, that she had gotten saved. And, uh, and uh, turn to... Turn to, or stand there in Matthew 26. Look back to verse 31. And uh, this kind of reminds me of someone that gets saved and, and how they're on fire for the Lord. And man, they, they, once they realize what the Lord has done for them, and uh, they think that they can do anything for the Lord, which is a good thing. Uh, in verse 31, look what it says, Matthew chapter 26, verse 31. It says, Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. And I, I think of that right there as, of course, that's confirmation of the rejuvenated will. That when you get saved, um, you have a desire. I think it's a natural desire that when you get saved, you basically save yourself and everybody around you. What do I do next? What can I do for the Lord next? And of course, what we see is here's the Lord talking to them and, and warning them of what was to come as far as his arrest and how they were going to be offended and they would uh, run off uh, from the Lord. And then when we see um, uh, Peter's uh, will, his desire, and of course, I believe we get this when we get saved, that we have a desire that we want to serve the Lord. I mean, we have... Uh, the spiritual nature in us now and uh, we have a desire we want to serve the Lord and uh, of course look at what Peter said again uh, verse 33 it says Peter answered and said unto him though all men shall be offended because of thee yet will I never be offended and of course then Jesus lays down a warning for him he said uh, in 34 he said Jesus said unto him verily I say unto thee that this night before the cock crow uh, thou shalt deny, deny me thrice Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. And uh, so that kind of takes you back to uh, verse 41 again, where it says, Watch and pray, that you are not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now that should remind us of ourselves as a, as a Christian newly saved or even saved for years. Uh, we have a rejuvenated uh, spirit or rejuvenated will in us where we want to do the best that we can to serve the Lord. And then, of course, what ends up happening and what I try to encourage us with is to introduce us in, uh, to our old nature. Because when we get saved, sometimes we've got to get that sorted out. That uh, when we get saved, not all, you know, it, that, that yes, we have a new nature, but then we have to realize that we have to be reintroduced to our old nature. And sometimes it's for the first time. Turn to, uh, turn to uh, verse 69 in that chapter, Matthew chapter 26 and verse 69. And of course, we, we know what took place in Peter's life. We know what Peter said, that Lord, I'll never forsake thee. And then of course, we know the end result. Uh, verse 69, it says, Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. But he, met, he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. Now you might not catch that, but what he's really doing is he's doing exactly what the Lord said he would do. Uh, Peter said, I will not deny thee, Christ. I will always be with you. And of course, what happens here is when in push comes to shove, uh, Christ, uh, Peter is denying Christ. Then read on, it says in, in uh, verse 71, it says, or in verse 70, it says, uh, but he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. Verse 71, it says, And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them uh, that were with uh, that were there, 
this fellow, he's, she's talking about uh, uh, Peter, this fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And then Peter again says, and again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. In uh, verse 73 it says, And after a while came unto him they, they that stood by, and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for this, thy speech bereath thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And then look at verse 75. This is kind of our key verse before we jump off into the new part of our uh, message tonight. But it says in verse 75, And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him before the cock crow, Thou shalt deny me thrice. And then here's what I believe. Uh, this response uh, probably means more than anything. This is, the, this is what I believe is the key um, to uh, Peter's revelation to what we should be looking at. Is because, then look what it says, those last, what is it, seven words of verse uh, 75. I believe this is the key. This will be the key in our life. Because then it says, and he went out and wept bitterly. Now, what I'm saying is, um, I, I believe that we, we're all going to have times, and I think we've all admitted it before, that we're all going to have times where we fail Christ. And I'm not saying this, giving you permission to do this. I'm saying this, saying that, you know what, uh, in all our Christian walk, there's going to be times, uh, and, and hopefully we're in the past, hopefully we're growing and uh, we won't have those times like we used to have. But there's going to be times, and in in, in maybe in your past, where you failed the Lord. You know, you, you, you said, I, I want to walk with the Lord. I want to do what the Lord says. I'm a new creature now. It says, uh, behold, uh, all things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. I want to be a new person. I want to be uh, a good Christian that follows the Lord. And then what happens? And then what happens is what we see happen in in Peter's life. He, 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 he basically said uh, to Christ, I will not fail thee. And of course, what ended up happening is he failed Christ. But as I said, I believe this is key right here. Look at what he said, those last, what is that, seven words in verse 75. It says, and he went out and he wept and wept bitterly. That means that when he failed Christ, it wasn't just like an everyday thing. It wasn't like he just, you know, that, that you can go out as a Christian and you, you say you're saved, but no matter what you do, it doesn't really matter. And you don't even really think about what you do. You don't even think about the failures. You don't even realize that you failed. Can you imagine being a Christian and following Christ and, and failing uh, following Christ and not even realize it? And just go on, you know, and, and the thing about it is, the funny thing is, there's people like that out there all the time. There's people that Christy and I, we can go knock their doors, and uh, they're, I mean, they're they're just they're just thick in sin in their lives, and 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 they'll say, "Oh, I'm saved, I'm serving the Lord, and oh, I have a good relationship with the Lord." And you look at their life, and you think, "Man, they have no clue. They have no clue whatsoever." And 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 the key here is, is like I said, what what Peter did is it says at the end he went out and he wept bitterly. That means he realized that he failed. He realized he was a failure. And, and even more so, look at, look at the beginning of verse 75, because this is what we all need to catch on to. And it says, and Peter remembered the word. And, and so uh, for what I'm talking about tonight, um, what we're talking about is, is we're talking about the two natures and how there's times, and I'm not giving us an excuse to be a failure, but I'm saying that you can expect it sometimes. And, and we'll never learn how not to fail if we don't figure out why we do fail. You understand what I'm saying? We'll never figure out how not to fail if we don't figure out why we fail. And that's what we're looking at tonight. And that's why we're, uh, my, my sermon from two weeks ago was titled this, The Two Natures, The Battle. Talking about the, the, the spiritual na nature battling the flesh of nature. And what we did is we took the example of Peter that we just looked at again very quickly. Uh, not quite as eloquent tonight looking at his life as we were a couple weeks ago. But what we're looking at is, is we're looking at the battle. Now what we're looking at tonight and what I want to spend a little time is, 
is I want to I want to spend some time identifying the two natures and looking a little closer at them, um, the natures that are in us. And so that's where we're going to go. And so first thing we're going to look at tonight is 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 can I say it again? We'll never we'll never figure out. Uh, we'll never figure out. I'm not challenging us. I'm not saying that you might as well get used to being failure. No, I'm just saying that you'll never figure out how not to fail if you never figure out why you fail. And so, uh, look at, and, and the best way to figure this out is to determine what exactly are we talking about when it comes to our two natures? And what exactly happened in us that took place that, 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 uh, that brought into us a battle of the two natures? Well, the first thing we're gonna look at is, is realize this. Number one, realize uh, the difference between the two natures. First one, of course, in us is our fleshly nature. Now turn back to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians, or turn to Ephesians chapter 2. And let me show you something here. Ephesians chapter 2. And so the first thing we're going to identify tonight is the two natures. So I'll let me write that up here. First one we're going to deal right deal with is the fleshly nature. The fleshly nature. Let's identify the fleshly nature tonight. But what it says, Ephesians chapter two, in uh, in uh, verse. Well, let's just start right at verse one. It says, "In you, of course, we know this passage of scripture. We've been in this before." And this is Paul. Paul probably helps us more than anybody as far as identifying the natures that are in us. And uh, Paul's talking about the spiritual nature versus the fleshly nature. And uh, he talks about that, that process that took place that, that when we got saved, we, we, uh, we spawned, in a sense, a spiritual nature. And it says, and you have to quicken, and this is the process that took place. It says, and you had the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Where in time past you walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And so right there, you might not be catching this, but right there, Paul's identifying both the fleshly nature and the spiritual nature. Now, when you look at that verse, what's some of the things it says about the fleshly nature? It says in you, talking about us, those of us that are saved, it says in you who uh, have he quickened. Now, he's talking about what you were like when you were in the flesh and nature. What's it, what were you like when you had the flesh and nature? What were you like? Look what it says. Who were what? Dead in trespasses and sins. And so one of the things that you can identify about the flesh and nature is the flesh and nature is dead. I won't write it all, but dead in sin. You got that? Dead in sin. That's what that's us. When we were when we were born into this world, it says you were dead in sin. And, and so what does that mean? Well, um, so let me ask you this. Have you ever thought about this? When did my sin nature come in? When did I get my sin nature? Think about this. Uh, I, I've said this many times before. I told you the story about knocking the door and talking to a lady who was holding a baby in her arms. And I knew better than to do this, but I knew who I was dealing with, and she was a Jehovah's Witness, and uh, we were talking about uh, the gospel and talking about how to get saved. And uh, she was dealing with the Jehovah's Witness, and she would have called herself a Jehovah's Witness. And so I told her about the sin nature. We were talking about the sin nature. And uh, she was holding that baby, and I said, well, when do you exactly think that you became a sinner? And uh, what ended up happening is, as we were talking, I, I basically showed her in the Bible that that little baby you're holding, that baby's a sinner. That baby has the sin nature. Oh, that just offended her because that's her precious little one. And I understand that. I mean, I look at my little precious grandchildren, and, uh, you know, when they're, when they're two months old or a month old, it's hard to look at them and think that they have a sin nature. But they do. But it just hasn't come out yet. And, and, and you talk to the closest ones to them, and like their mom, many times they, they you know, if, if their mom will admit it, and uh, their mom has a little bit of spiritual sense about them, 
uh, they don't realize that that little one has a sin nature. I mean, they can catch them doing things, and even at even at an age when you cannot talk, you can you can lie in a sense. Uh, we've talked about that a lot of times, where a baby many times will lie to their mom to get them to come to the crib and pick them up. They'll act like they're in pain. They'll cry in pain and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so, so as I said, what, what we're talking about, and that's what I kind of shared with that lady. Of course, she wasn't buying into it. But what I'm saying is, is what we need to realize is the fleshly nature, what we know about it, is it's dead it's in. And when does it start? Well, you could go to John. I think it's John chapter 3. And uh, is it like verse 6? John, don't turn there. Let me read it to you. And, and it's the verse that it talks about in John chapter 3. And uh, in verse 6, what's it say? John chapter 3, verse 6, it says, That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And so, so what we can gain from that is we can understand that the flesh in nature, that which is born of flesh is flesh, what does the Bible say? Paul will tell us all through his writings that when you're born in the flesh, you're born dead into sin. And when does that take place? I believe it even takes place uh, prior to, I believe it takes place at conception. I believe even when that, you know, I, I haven't thought about this that closely and somebody can probably take me to task on it, but I think even at the point of conception, as soon as that child is, is living and sucking its thumb in its mother's womb, it already has the sin nature. Amen. It has the sin nature. That's just the way it is. It's the fall of the nature. And so when does it, when does the fleshly nature, when does the sin nature come into a person? I believe it's at conception. Um, so we might take the task on that, but I'll, I'll be more than glad to talk about it. And so I believe it's present at conception. And uh, John, or is it uh, Job 14.1 basically says, uh, that our life is full of sin. And, and so, um, look at verse 3. You're, you're still in Ephesians chapter 2. It says in verse 3, Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the loss of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And so, uh, just as I said, the fleshly nature, uh, we can see that, that when it came, when we uh, when we received the flesh of nature. Now, how did that all take place? Well, write this down. When did we? Where did this flesh of nature come from? How did we? How did that come to be? Well, we know how it happened. If you was to turn to Romans, turn there. Romans chapter five, and verse twelve. Romans chapter five and verse twelve. Look what it says. And uh, these are pretty common, pretty easy. Uh, verse is not easy, but in a sense, uh, um, they're pretty well known, pretty well, uh, pretty pretty solid doctrine for the sin nature. But look at verse Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, there it is, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And so right there it is. That's how sinful it is. The flesh and nature. What's it mean? Well, it means we're dead in sin. When did we receive it? When did we receive it at conception? Um, how, did it, how did it take place? Uh, it happened. How did it come to be? It came because of the fall of man. The fall of mankind. The fall of Adam and, uh, and Eve. And so the Bible has names for this nature. Uh, turn to, you're in Romans right now. Look at Romans 6, 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse 6. What do we, what do we call, uh, who, what do we call this, this old nature, this fleshly nature? What's the name of it? What's Romans 6, 6 say? Romans chapter 6 and verse 6. It says, knowing this, that the, What's it say there? Anybody there? Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Knowing this, that, that the old man is crucified with him. There's, the, there's one of the names uh, that it talks about. How it identifies that nature that's in us. It's the old man. 
Now, why would it call the old man? Well, it, it called the old man because when you got saved, when you were born again, uh, when you were uh, rejuvenated, when you were, like what Ephesians chapter 2 in uh, verse 2 says, uh, when it talks about um, that, that term it uses in Ephesians chapter 2, when you were quickened, it's talking about uh, having new life. Becoming a new man. Now I know this maybe isn't as, as identifiable with a woman, but it's talking about mankind. And uh, so, just as I said, what uh, what it calls is the old man. Now there's another name for it. First Corinthians chapter two, verse fourteen. There's another term. You don't have to necessarily look, uh, but what it's, what it's called is the old nature. And that's what we're talking about. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 13. Talk about the old nature, or the natural man, is what it is. 2, 14, I'm sorry. 2, 14. Old nature, the natural man. Why are we doing this, Pastor? Because if, we, if we'll identify this nature, and identify these natures in us, uh, then we'll know how to handle it. And what to do. And so what's this telling us? Well, this man, that nature right there that we're talking about is at, a, at odds with the Creator. In other words, that old nature in you has nothing in common with God. Wants nothing to do with God. No, I don't believe that. I believe everybody has a natural. No, I'm telling you that your natural man, if you used to look at Romans, and uh, you look a little closer at Romans chapter 3, and if you'll believe what God's Word says, it says in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, that there is none righteous, no, not one. Now, it's not talking about the saved person. It's not talking about someone that has been born again. This is talking about, uh, uh, Paul's talking about the man before he has become saved, before he's accepted Christ as his Savior. He says there is none righteous, no, not one. And then he starts to identify the nature. That's in someone that's not saved. He says they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. It says their, their throat is as an open sepulchre with their tongues. They have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Uh, their feet are as swift to shed blood. I mean, on and on you can go. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And just as verse 11 says, which is probably the most important verse, there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. And so do you understand what I'm talking about? That when we think about this flesh and nature, and we think about all the things about the, uh, this nature that the Bible talks about, this, that nature right there, just like the Bible says, is at odds with God. Romans, uh, Romans 7, verse 18, we used this last week. Romans chapter 7 and verse 18, it says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. That's Paul. He says, to, For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. So he's talking about in my flesh, how to perform anything good for God, how to do anything for God, how to do right for God, how to live for God. I don't, I don't have it. It's not in me. It's not in there. And then he keeps on talking, and, he's, and then he's talking, of course, Paul's talking from the spiritual perspective. So he says, in me, that is in my flesh. So he's, a, he's, he's saying definitely there's two natures. But he says, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then law that when I would do good, meaning I'm saved, I want to do good. I want to serve the Lord. Now this is Paul. Of course, talking about Paul as a spiritual man. Paul that's gotten saved. This is Paul. This is Paul post Acts 9 when he got saved in the Bible. And, and he's talking about the battle that he's going through. He's talking about the two natures that he has. And like I said, you're never going to know how to battle in, you know, for God. And you're never going to know how to battle your sin nature if you can't identify it. If you can't tell the difference between the two. 
If you can't realize there's an old man in you that, that wants to do everything against what God says to do. And that's what Paul is telling us. That's why Paul, that's why probably this is one of the most important parts of the whole Bible as far as teaching us how to walk as a Christian would be in, in Romans chapter 7. Because Paul's admitting, as good a bank, an apostle as Paul was, as he's probably one of the greatest uh, uh, examples of mankind as far as someone being a Christian, but yet Paul says, I, I have an answer in me that, man, I don't want to serve God. Even when I want to, I, you know, he, he says again, for I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And that is probably the greatest uh, help that you will ever find to serving God is when you realize that in you, in your flesh, that he, again he says, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. So in my flesh, I can't, I can't serve God like I should. And I'm, I'm always at odds with God. I'm always bad. That's what, that's what Paul wants us to understand. And, and it's amazing when you think about um, um, the truth that Paul has given us. And can I tell you something else? Um, look at Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 7. We're in Romans 7. Now look at 8, verse 7. Paul wants you to know something else. What's he telling us? Look what it says. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now you know what that tells us? That your fleshly nature can in no way, shape, or form be tamed. It can't be tamed. You can't, you can't reform your fleshly nature. You can't reform that, that, that old man, that, that natural man that's in you. Just because you got saved, does it, you know, we're not like Nazarenes, where we say that we can, we can basically whip our body and we can get ourselves to a point where we can, we can, we can do away with the natural man. And we can tame it, we can reform it, and we can convince it to follow God. Never going to happen. Won't happen. Look what it says. It says in Romans chapter 8, verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Do you understand? You're always going to have a carnal mind. Amen. You're always going to have a carnal nature. You're always going to have, if you've, been ex if you've been exposed to anything in this world, you're always going to have carnal things that pop into your brain. You're going to have pictures of things that you, you know, and, and what you're going to have to do is learn how to fight it. Learn how to allow your spiritual nature to overtake your flesh nature. Now, as I said, you'll never tame it. You'll never rid yourself of it. You'll never convince the fleshly nature to come on the side of the spiritual nature. It'll never happen. Always going to be a battle. Paul says it. He's, he's telling us back in Romans chapter 7. Again, he says, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwell no good thing. I'll never be able to tame it. You see, that's an important thing to think about. That's an important thing to realize. Can I say that point again? The fleshly, the fleshly nature cannot be tamed. The fleshly nature is, going, is always condemned. Look at, listen to this. Uh, stay there where you're at. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and uh, verse 22. Listen to what it says. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and uh, verse 22. This is what it says. It says, If any man love not the Lord Jesus, let him be anathema. Uh, Maranatha, is that the one I was looking at? Yes, fifteen twenty-two, and he's talking about what's going to happen is, is, is the these the the fleshy nature in us will be judged. It's going to be judged. The fleshy nature is condemned. It's condemned to be judged. Uh, Ephesians chapter two and uh, verse three again. Stay there where you're at. Let me read it to you. Ephesians chapter 2, in uh, verse 3, it says, According to whom also we all had our conversation times past 
and the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of flesh and the mind, and we're by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So the flesh and nature cannot be tamed. The flesh and nature is condemned, and always will be. Now let's shift gears. Let's talk about the spiritual nature for a little bit. And like I said, the most important thing I probably said about the flesh and nature, yes, it's dead and sin. Yes, we received to that conception. Yes, uh, the, we know the name of it. It's natural man, the old man, the old nature. And one of the most important things I said about it is you can do nothing to tame it. It's always going to be there. It's always going to be fighting against you. But here's the key. We also know we have a spiritual nature. And look at what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. It says, And you, hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. It says, Where in time past you walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince and power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. When we read that verse, we have to say, Well, well, that's what we used to be. What are we like now? Well, we're the opposite of that now. Now that, now that we've been saved, well, we've been given a new nature. We didn't lose the old nature, but we've been given a new nature. We've been given a nature now that doesn't walk according to the course of this world. We have a, we have a nature now that if we'll do what that nature desires us to do with the Holy Spirit, and we don't grieve the Holy Spirit, then what will happen is that new nature that's in us won't walk according to the course of the world. And it won't walk according to the prince and power of the air. And, and it won't want to, want to conform to the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You see. And so you see the difference here. And so the spiritual nature, what we're talking about. And when did we receive the spiritual nature? Well, in a lot of ways, uh, in a lot of ways, it's kind of like the flesh nature. When we receive the spiritual nature... We put the spiritual nature over here. We'll put it in blue. So when did we receive the spiritual nature? What do we know about that? Well, the spiritual nature, what do we know about it? When did we receive it? Of course, it says right there in Ephesians chapter 2. It says, and you have been quickened who were dead in the trespasses and sins. When did we receive the spiritual nature? We received the spiritual nature when we got saved. Salvation. Salvation is what uh, brought in the spiritual nature. Salvation, of course, is when uh, the Holy Spirit moved in us. That's what makes the difference. The Holy Spirit moved in us. An amazing new birth that we received. And although John, although John 3.16 is not the gospel, it gives the big picture of the new birth. That's why I love that verse, is because once you get the big picture uh, of, the, of what takes place, it says, it says in John uh, chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now that doesn't give us, it gives us the details. But what it tells us is that uh, God sent his son to die on that cross, to die on that cross, to shed his blood for our sin. And when we accept that payment that he made for our sin wage, then what happens is, of course, we've looked at it in John chapter 7, when we see what happened is, when we got saved, the Holy Spirit moved in, that's what gives us the new nature. All of a sudden, we've been given life. All of a sudden, we've been given something in us that now we have a nature that does the opposite of the old man, of the flesh nature. All the, all the things that the Bible says about the flesh nature, the spirit, spiritual nature is the opposite. You go to Romans chapter 3 and verse 10 when it tells, tells you that your mouth is an open sepulcher and uh, you desire not the God, not God at all. Now what happens is when you got saved and you receive the spiritual nature, now you desire God. You desire to learn about him. And you, you understand him. You see. And so what a difference it makes. It gives. And so what we see here is what the spiritual nature does for us. And in the amazing event that takes place. 
at the new birth. Turn to uh, Colossians. If you're in Ephesians right now, turn a little bit farther. And uh, the next book past Ephesians is Colossians. And look at Colossians chapter 2 in verse of that. Here's an amazing thing that took place. I won't go too deeply into this. But we've seen this many times before. And I'm getting to drop. Colossians, look what it says. Colossians chapter 8 there. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. It says, In whom, all, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. You know what that talks about? That talks about how we can have the Holy Spirit in us, and even at times, we went from being dead to now we have the Holy Spirit that's in a weird color. Now that we're filled with the Holy Spirit and something has happened and I remember Josh doing a sermon on this about how we can still how even though we may stumble into sin we can still have the Holy Spirit in us and be his temple. And even though our body sins, it doesn't necessarily affect the Holy Spirit in us as far as it doesn't chase him out of us because we're, we're inundated with sin. And, and that's what, what's explaining that is right here in Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. It says, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And what an amazing thing that takes place. That, that what happens in us is within us, how would you say it, is something that's pure. And even though there's times where we, this is where people struggle when they think, well, well, because you've got a lot of churches out there, they think, well, if, you're, if you've sinned, then you definitely can't be saved. Because if you've sinned, then, then there's no way you can have the Holy Spirit in you and still sin. So what must happen is the Holy Spirit, he takes off when you sin. No. According to what the, the Bible teaches us is that we've been, uh, you can stumble into sin and still have the Holy Spirit in you. Now, you can grieve the Holy Spirit in you just like the Bible says. But, but what it says is, is it says there in that, in that Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Some people would take that as saying, well, that means that when I got saved, then I put off sin and I can't sin anymore. No, that's not true. What it's talking about is a circumcision that's taking place inside of you, that you can still be God's holy temple. And yes, your body can sin, but you're not affecting the Holy Spirit that's in you. Other than, yes, you can grieve Him. When you understand what you're supposed to do and you don't do it right, then you can grieve Him. And, and you, can, you can, how would you say it? You can, uh, you can grieve Him in you to where you can't, you, He can't lead you like He'd like to lead you, but He's not leaving he, uh, that's a good way to say it. He can't lead you, but he's not leading you. You see. And that's kind of what that verse is talking about. Who, it says again in verse, uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him uh, through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you, being dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. And so you see what it's doing? Uh, and so what, I, what I'd say again is that it doesn't mean not capable of sin, but it separates the flesh from the soul, uh, which houses the Holy Spirit. And, and so what we're doing 
is what it's boiling down to is when we can identify these two natures, and just like what Peter did, there was a time when Peter, Peter would have got to the point where he said, you know what? And he did this. He's saved. He fails Christ. And then he says basically to himself, it's over. I guess I'm not saved. And I guess that none of this ever worked because I failed Christ. But what he found out is no. What you have to do is, is learn what to do as a saved person. And realize that you can still sin as a saved person. And, and learn what Paul learned. That you know what? Uh, Paul again, and we'll close with this. Look at, uh, look at Romans chapter 7. Probably one of the most important chapters that you'll read about how to walk and follow Christ. Is in Romans chapter 7. When he says, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwell is no good thing. For to will is present that. Uh, present with me, but how to form, perform that which is good, I find not. So when he, Paul says, when I when I'm in my when I'm in my flesh, I realize that I can't follow Christ. And then he says, and then what he does is he basically says there towards the end, he says, "O wretched man that I am, what well, who shall deliver me from this body?" He's talking about his flesh. This body, this body of death. And then he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I don't think he's talking about just when the Lord resurrects, or when the Lord comes back and resurrects us, or raptures us out of here. I believe he's talking about even, even in our daily walk with him. That what he shows us is that, you know what? If I put my faith in Christ, and my faith in the Holy Spirit which lives in me, and I feed my spiritual self, and I and I fellowship with spiritual people, and I denounce sinful things, I can walk and follow Christ, and I can defeat the flesh of nature. And that's what we have to learn. Amen. That's how simple it is. Now I don't know if I made it so simple, uh, but but what an important thing to realize about the two natures. And, and again, quickly, can I say a couple things that, um, that we can kind of cap stone this off with. Remember that we always have a fleshly nature with us. We'll never get rid of it. Uh, always remember that your fleshly nature, um, you cannot tame it. You'll always have it. You can't get rid of it, and you can't tame it. You're always going to have a fleshly nature who's going to who, if you let your flesh and nature reign in you, then it will go against God. But what Paul wants us to realize is, through Christ, we can serve God. And I tell the little story. Um, there's a mind, it's uh, Wilkinson, always told this story about imagining your natures being as two dogs. A sheep dog, and then of course like a wolf. Of course, the sheepdog is the good one. And he says, whichever one you feed the most is the one that's going to dominate. You'll never kill one of them. You, you know, even starving the flesh and nature, you're not going to kill it off. It'll always be there. Waiting to feed on something that you'll give it. And, and if you'll feed it more than the spiritual nature, it'll rise up and it'll defeat the spiritual nature. And so what Wilkerson always said to do is he said, Whichever one you feed the most is the one that's going to dominate. And so, and so when we think about our, our spiritual nature as the good dog and the flesh nature as the bad one, whichever you feed the most is going to be the one that dominates. And how do, we, how do we feed the spiritual nature? Well, just like what we're doing tonight. We come and we dance to the music. <laughs> I guess that's my, uh, yeah, it's right in class, right <laughs> yeah. I guess that's my quitting time. Uh -huh. So which do you feed the most is the one that's going to die. Amen. All right, let's close with prayer. Father, we're grateful, Lord, and I pray that you bless us. And uh, Lord, help us to realize, uh, Lord, some of the important things about our natures. And Lord.